Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sense Podcast brought to you by AYGF. And you might want to ask, what is Sense? Sense stands for sustainability, education, nutrition, social justice, and the environment. We hope you have been playing your part in impacting in your community. Well, today's edition, we're going to be looking at something very, very important, a very uh, uh, important discussion that is very dear to our heart, especially because uh, we have lots of women in AYG, yeah? and so it's important that we touch on a topic that is uh, very dear to us, which is uh, the issue of menstrual hygiene. Uh, officially, it's been 10 years since uh, the awareness on menstrual hygiene, the importance of creating awareness around menstrual hygiene started. And uh, we are going to be looking at that very important topic today on the Sense podcast. And to do us justice to that, we're going to be having uh, a guest on our show uh, to educate us on the importance of menstrual hygiene, uh, the importance of stakeholders coming together uh, to uh, put a spotlight on why we should collectively, you know, look at uh, some of the issues around menstrual hygiene, especially for women in uh, rural areas, women in water areas. So it's important that we have these discussions. Uh, I'm going to be your host, I'm a Lauren to be at Dejari uh, with my team. Uh, we'll go on a short break and when we come back, we'll be introducing our guest to you. Don't forget, it's the Sense Podcast. Welcome back. It's still the Sense podcast brought to you by AYGF. Sense stands for sustainability, education, nutrition, social justice, and the environment. And like we said earlier, we do hope that you're playing your part in being an amazing and impactful citizen in your community. Today, we're going to be looking at menstrual hygiene. Uh, and to do justice to that topic, we have uh, Ayomi Posi Ogundipe, who is very passionate, resilient, and uh, very dedicated to uh, causes around impacting in our immediate environment and beyond, with a very deep commitment to the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4. And she believes that true change begins with every individual action that we take. Uh, she's a very social impactor. Uh, advocate she's or she also has her own NGO and um, through her volunteering and also her years of experience when it comes to uh, working on impact project she is going to be talking to us today uh, about uh, menstrual hygiene uh, hello Ayomi Posi how you doing hi Sylvia good afternoon good afternoon good to have you here nice to be on sense I can see you. that uh, your t-shirt says let's call it what it is Period. And that's, she, some, and that's period. some period. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I, I think I should also cop my own, you know, tees. I'm a lover of tees, so I think this is something that I would want to wear. So I hope that you'll send me one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So glad to have you on the Sense Podcast. Now, so quickly, uh, menstrual health is a fundamental aspect of human rights, dignity, and public health. Now, millions of women and girls around the world are uh, prevented from reaching their full potential just because they menstruate. Now, menstrual hygiene is a chance to highlight the importance of menstrual care and raise awareness about the issues faced by those who don't have access to menstrual products. Now, this year, Menstrual Hygiene Day turns 10. That means 10 years of campaigning and advocating, 10 years of changing how the world perceives menstruation. Now, like we said, it's been 10 years since the awareness of menstrual hygiene kicked off. Can you share insights on the current state of menstrual hygiene awareness in Nigeria? 
Thank you, Toby, for that question. And first of all, I'm so glad that it's 10 years. And you know, I'll just take you memory, down memory lane. Back in 2018, when I just joined the social impact space, going through the feed, I mean, just going to school to talk to girls about um, menstruation. To so even get access to these schools, there were a lot of problems. I mean, why are you talking about menstruation in school? What happens to our boys that are in school? But now, everybody wants you to come and talk to them. Everybody wants you to ask, have access to their girls. Every community has somebody that has visited them as regards access to information about menstruation. And that's a lot of growth. That's a lot of, I mean, increase in awareness. And, you know, when you go to... So today, we still have a lot of people that don't know, know so much, but we don't have it like it was before. Access to menstrual products might be a thing, but awareness is now everywhere. I mean, going through Instagram, going through everywhere social media, menstruation is now normal. I mean, I can boldly wear my menstruation shirt and nobody waits an eyebrow or to me at anymore. I mean, that's a lot of growth. It's May 28th today, and I'm amazed at many things, many events, many occasions that are going on everywhere, unlike before. I mean, even men are in the conversation, boys are in the conversation. Stakeholders, I mean, or community leaders, press, everybody is just in the conversation because it's now a grand thing. It's no longer the um, former conversation of uh, it's for girls. Can we just talk about this private? Can we reduce our voices? Can we pack them to the corner? Everybody now knows that this is a big deal. And that's a lot of, I mean, growth for me. And the statistic says that we have 40% increase back to 2020, back at 2019. It, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot, really. All right, so do you think that there are still some misconceptions about uh, menstrual, you know, menstruation in general, menstrual hygiene, uh, you know, even though we have been at this awareness for 10 years? Okay, so that's a very big yes. And I'll just cite insights from the field. So I was at this school back in February, um, okay. junior school, and I, I just popped the question. So when you want to get a pad and you meet a man in the chemist, are you going to get a pad? Everybody just screamed, no. And I, I, I had to ask again, maybe they didn't get my question. Will you buy the pad if a guy is the one in charge of the pharmacy? They can't say you no. Know. So I had to, I mean, ask questions why. They said, oh, because he's going to um, use their blood, because he's going to follow them, he's going to tell them. And that's a lot of somewhere, somewhere. Somebody has pumped some false information into them. So I mean, among the fact that there are a lot of awareness, we still have a lot of silent misconceptions everywhere. When I got to Abuja back in 2022, uh, and, and that was where I knew there was a, still a lot of problem. I, I, remember, I remember meeting this girl, Precious, and we're just talking. All of a sudden, I mean, we just just stared into menstruation. And she told me, oh, we don't, we don't go out where we are on our period in our community. It, it sounded so weird. <laughs> so weird. So I had to ask her, OK, so what was the problem? Why, why, if you go out, what will happen? How will people know where you go? So, after asking a series of questions, I detected that the problem was they don't use pads. So in my mind, I just tell wow. myself that so somebody came up with this story. Just to, I mean, tell the women to just sit down and then maybe not go for so the we, right So we can see that some of this misconception even started from the home front because I think I it, it took me getting into the development space to realize that uh, the whole menstrual hygiene thing was a big issue because growing up, I don't think I ever had to be shy to get sanitary towel in a mm -hmm. pharmacy or a supermarket, or maybe I see a male attendant there and I'm shying away from it. I didn't ever have that experience. So hearing so many people talk about the experience, people can buy sanitary towels when there are men there, or people can't even say, oh, I'm on my period, you have to code, I'm having my red, or I'm whatever. <laughs> you know, so many, so many terms to just say that I'm on my period. So how do you think that we can change this narrative even from the home front? Okay, so from the home front, looking at, so I'll just talk about a boy and a girl growing up together, and then the mother wants to talk to the girl. Goes, oh, do you have your thing? Are you on your thing? Is there something wrong with you? Is it that thing? And then because just the boy brother is there, not even an outsider. What so is that <laughs> thing? <laughs> so can we can we begin to have a normal conversation with our girls? Can we begin to have conversation even with the boys? This is an organization I see um, online, and they, what they do is they talk to boys directly um, about menstruation. And you know the impact of that will be that when we go to schools and we give these girls parts, they don't want the boys to see it. 
So immediately they rush it into their bag. But imagine we have boys that know what menstruation is. They won't joke, they won't smile when they see pads. It's not something weird. You know, it's going to be easy for the girl child to easily have this conversation in class. Imagine a girl child where the pad falls in the, um, falls in the class and she's so shy to pick it up because the boys will laugh at her. So why don't parents, I mean, take this conversation down to the boys? Can we have normal conversations where we begin to let everybody in the family know that? I mean, oh, a bro I mean, a brother should be able to so, go out there and help the sister get a sanitary towel. So that is it. Can we have conversations where the brother even gets the pad for the girl? Can we have a, a, a home where uh, the boy has, oh, is it because of your period? Look, okay, I'll help you out. I mean, that would be some great thing. Some husbands don't even know the kind of sanitary towel their wives <laughs> use. And then you know, honey, please help. Can you help me get a sanitary towel when you're coming back? And then he's at the supermarket, he's confused. And then he's probably, maybe he, he luckily he sees another one. Oh my God, please, uh, which one do you use? Which, <laughs> you know, and you know, it can be really different. And uh, this products vary according to, you know, skin types yes, and all of those yes. things. So I think it's also important that as partners, you, you should be aware of your wife's menstrual flow, her calendar, and also the kind of products that she uses. All right, so uh, Ayomi Posi. Now, the cable says about 37 million women in Nigeria uh, still cannot afford menstrual hygiene products. And uh, almost every family planning or sex uh, seminars, or even on the streets, people are giving free condoms. I mean, if people can be given free condoms, why can't women be given free pads? Okay, so thank you, Toby. So that question is really interesting. And I'll start from, so menstrual, so because menstrual products is something you have to use monthly, also put into consideration that, I mean, somebody like me might not be okay with just one such one pack of pad in one. I mean, I have to use 14 pieces, 15 pieces, and we have eight pieces on the mm -hmm. So, menstrual products, we access to menstrual products will always be a thing because this is something I have to use every month, every month, 28 days, 27 days. I need it to be. Do you think if I go to different seminars, I probably won't have like a two or three month supply? Mm, I, I really wish. Or maybe at the health, primary health care centers or something. Okay, so I think um, for menstrual products, because the prices are now very, very outrageous, I mean, the economy, maybe. But the prices are now very outrageous. You find people giving uh, pads just when they have access to it. I mean, let's try anything they give. And going, I'm going to speak to give a pad to give today. A pad costed me 900 naira. Seeing that I'm buying a book. So now imagine somebody that wants to do a conference. A very, a very go good one. And cash it. Wouldn't they rather go for something that will cost them so much? Okay, so considering the cost of uh, menstrual pads, are currently in Nigeria, considering uh, the high cost of uh, dollar, and then uh, we have some companies that have also exited the country. So uh, there is most people have to bring in some of these products now. For those who barely survive, for those who find themselves in areas where they barely even have access to these things, now what are the alternatives that uh, they can use? We've seen topics around menstrual cup, tampons, and so many other things. What, what is that most affordable alternative menstrual hygiene products that women and girls can actually have ready access to? Okay, so yeah, I already mentioned tampon, I already mentioned menstrual cup. And in answering your question, I'll just mention all that. When we are talking about accessibility to this thing, you won't mention things that are actually high. You know, you won't recommend a menstrual cup to a girl that they can't afford it 800 naira pad. Menstrual cup will cost me at about 35, 3,000 to get one. Okay, Don't but I thought, I'm, it's, it's not something that I use, but what I'm familiar with, but I thought they said it's like a, it's like something, it's something that if you buy, for instance, you can reuse for a very long time. Yeah. So please enlighten me. Okay, on. so menstrual cup is reusable. But the problem is, how does a girl get the money to buy it at once? So there is um, an alternative of reusable pads. And, you know, I'm an advocate of reusable pads because okay. I've gone to these communities. I've seen how these ones live. They can't even afford to, even if you say you want to sell to your paper for them for 350 they would rather go for a, they would rather go for a material. 
And that, that was why I filmed this crash. Two things I've been talking about with the Pack. And I know that they're really, really going now. I know. So we use a that are made from just normal fabrics. Just the normal fabrics that we wear. Um, I mean, I won't go into so much details, but just the normal fabrics that we use. Something that is relatable with everyone. And we have a lot of organizations that um, train these girls how to produce, even though majority still does not have the money to get them. It's, it's that bad. Even when you train them, they don't have the money to get the materials to make their parts for themselves. So I think this is where we come in as stakeholders. Now, how can we improve investment and training in the aspect of reusable pads because yeah i have one mm -hmm. and i have used it before i think it was something gotten from an airline i know some okay. airlines are infusing yeah. it in some yeah. of their toiletries now so uh, as we come to the end of the program gradually how do you think that our stakeholders uh, but uh, but ngos government officials and so many other organizations how do you think we can come in to ensure that we put more investment in reusable parts, making of reusable parts and then access to these reusable parts. All right. So I was going to start from, so while we want to provide solution, one thing that should be at the full of is sustainability. As much as you want to do our project and dash out, you want to um, I mean, provide the immediate solution and think we've solved it. A lot of times you train up again. And this is why I say, when you train 3,000 girls to make a reusable part, and they do other sense. So why not we, um, so I know there's an organization in Nigeria that they sell reusable parts. They're in Niger State. They sell reusable parts. They also sell kits. So why not we adopt something like that? We go with the kids, we train the girls, they are able to make the parts themselves. So they have the kids, that's the solution. They have the kids, we train them to make them, and that, that's something. So instead of just going, showing up, training them with more material, then when we are going, everybody just have, sometimes they don't even have one to themselves. We just have to say, so you, when you want to do, just buy this material, buy this one, buy this one, so it's like this, and we go. And the problem with that is, next week, Next two weeks, do I didn't need to remember. So I think the investment should just be the investments we stakeholders are now bringing should be um, channeled directly. So do we do we are we sure this is something that will be helpful? When is we go, a sustainable yes. Method? When when I go two months time, will this still be there? Will the girl be able to assess this thing next week? And this is one of the you I have with disposable pads. When I give you pad, and then I, I just feel like I give you pad for this month tomorrow or next month you go back to whatever it is that you use why 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 don't we just um get more i mean the reusable part is quite expensive so why don't we just get more money give you the reusable pads and i mean solve the problem for three to six months that we know that will probably be try something else can come up i can come back to, to check on you but well i mean i i really don't have an issue with training the girls without giving them access to the materials to make it so, I mean, we can give them kits, we can provide them, um, we can do in, more intense work, more intense work. And I think a lot of people are just on the surface level. We can do much more intense work. We can spend three hours, give these girls the kits, we make it together. And like that, we are just, we are sure something has really happened. Yes. All right, thank you so much. I really, I really like that idea of, uh, you know, the reusable pads and uh, like you said, it's important that we invest in teaching these girls how to actually make these reusable parts because we will not always be there to give them, you know, and that's one of the core uh, things that we always, you know, uh, in BIPE and AYGF, mm -hmm. uh, our nutrition program in some states in Nigeria, as much as we're giving nutrition supplements, what we are also doing is that even after we the program eventually ends, we are empowering them to be able to make some foods that will supply them with some of these nutrition supplements that we have been giving them so far. And I think it's something that can also be replicated in terms of, uh, you know, menstrual products. Uh, it's been a really, really insightful session with you, Ayomi Posi Ogundikwe. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the Sense Podcast. Okay, menstrual hygiene. Now, menstrual hygiene is more than just a health issue. It's a matter of human rights, uh, dignity and equality. Now, as we celebrate Menstrual Hygiene Day 2024, let's commit to creating a world where everyone can access safe and dignified menstrual hygiene management. We urge you today that you lend your voice as we work towards achieving 
a period friendly world which is the core theme for this year uh, this has been a production of uh, executive producer has been Aramis Salifu, Dr. Aramis Salifu. And I have been your host, yes truly, the amiable, the delectable, or learn to be at Dejare. Until we come here again, stay safe, be good, and make sure that you empower a girl out there with menstrual products.